see there. But since you're here today, let's talk about science. Hey, my name is Amanda Clausen, and I'm a senior at Texas A&M University. Right now, we are in the basement of Biological Sciences Building. We're in the Biological Clock Institute at Texas A&M University. A little bit about myself. I'm from Houston, Texas. I first became interested in science when I was a little girl, and on my birthday, my parents got me a young scientist microscope. And all I did was play with it for years and years and years, and collected samples and looked at things under the microscope. And basically, it sparked my interest in science. And so here I am now, doing research. So come on, let me show you what it's all about. So my research interest is biological clocks. Now, what is a biological clock? Is it just a clock that ticks when you get older? Well, not exactly. It does a lot more than that. Everything from the smallest bacteria to something as complex as humans, we all have biological clocks. Now, what does it do? It controls everything in your body. It sets the pace for your body to know exactly what time to do things, for when you should go to sleep, when you need to wake up, what your body temperature should be at a certain time of the day, uh, when you're hungry, when you have to go to the bathroom. So why am I interested in biological clocks? Well, there's a couple reasons. First, biological, clo biological clock control has a lot to do with neurological disorders, like insomnia, depression, schizophrenia, even jet lag. Have you ever flown anywhere really, really far away and you wake up the next morning feeling terrible? Well, that has to do with your biological clock and how it's entrained to the light-dark cycle of your regular day. Secondly, certain things happen at certain times of the day, certain conditions, like a heart attack or a stroke or even an asthma attack all happens at certain times of the day. So we're doing an area of research called chronopharmacology to find out when is the best time to give medications and how can we best help people based on what happens at certain times of the day. That all has to do with your biological clock inside of your body. So this is a research poster. This is how researchers, or graduate students, undergraduates, and um, researchers just convey information to each other in a, in a fashion that's easy to understand. So I've explained a biological clock to you. Uh, this is my specific project, and it might not make a lot of sense to you now. It's called Effects of Pinealectomy on Hypothalamic Metabolic and Clock Gene Rhythms. <laughs> Long word, I know. And what I do is I work with house sparrows, House sparrows, uh, the Latin name is Passer domesticus. And what I do with them is I remove their pineal glands. Can you zoom in on this? And they have a gland at the top of their brain. And we, we're, we're brain surgeons on these birds. And we remove this gland and we see the effects of what happens on their biological clock and on their metabolism. Here we are at the bird room. I have to be a little quiet because there's animals all down this hallway. Sometimes they're sleeping in the morning. Okay, so this is where we keep the sparrows. Just looking for a closer look. Can you see anything? Probably not. <laughs> There's a reason for that. We keep this room dark because we're trying to control the light-dark cycles of the birds, right? For the biological clocks that we talked about earlier. So when we keep them in the dark, we can turn lights on and off whenever we want and then kind of mess with their sleep-wake cycle, and then that helps us in our experiments. So in that room, there's 24 sparrows in 24 different cages, and they have all these perches to hop around on, right? So every time that they hop on a perch, it's, it goes to a wire, and it comes all the way to this computer that detects their activity. We keep this computer behind this door, and we monitor their activity all on here. So every animal in here, even the, even the mice, we have them on wheels, and so every time they run on their wheel, it goes directly to this computer and we can monitor every single bit of time that they're awake or they're asleep. So remember that computer that I showed you back in the bird room? We, this is what an actogram actually looks like. So each little black mark is every time those birds hop on their perch, it makes a little tick and it makes a black mark. And this shows that when the lights are on, the white bars, that they're active during the day, and when the lights are off, they're going to sleep. But after they have their surgery and we put them into constant darkness, they don't know when, when is day or night, and they're just active all the time. 
Okay, so where are we? We've already removed the bird's pineal gland that's on the top of its head. We have obtained a behavioral data, so we, so we see when they're going to bed and when they're going to sleep. Now it's time to remove their brain tissue. But there's one important fact. Birds' brains, unlike human brains, are photoreceptive, which means they respond to light. But we don't want them to respond to light. We're trying to control their life cycle. So when we take their brains out, we have to wear infrared goggles, like special night vision goggles, so we can see, but there's no light available. And then, once we remove the brains, we freeze them rapidly in liquid nitrogen at minus 80 degrees Celsius, so for sectioning later. Snazzy, huh? Okay, so after we remove the brain from the sparrow, we put it into a really, really, really cold freezer at minus 80 degrees Celsius to um, keep the brain frozen. And then once we have to cut it, we use this machine, it's called a cryostat, and it's kept at minus 20 degrees because there's information that we need from the brain, and, and if the brain gets too warm, it'll degrade, and then we can't get the information that we want. So we come over to this machine, we remove the brain, see this very well. I put it on one of these, it's called a chuck. And then we'll use this uh, liquid that freezes with it to mount it on here. And then we hook it up to this thing. And now right down in here, can you zoom in? We, have, we get a really, really, really sharp blade. This blade can cut your finger off if you're not careful. And we cut this brain down into little tiny slices that are 20 microns thick. Which is really, really, really small. And then we take these slides, which are heated up just a little bit, and we have to pick up the brain tissue just perfectly, which takes a lot of practice, at least for me. And then your final product you get is a lot of slides with your brain tissue mounted on it. And then we have to go to our next step. After we take the slides of the brain tissue, we put them back in the really, really, really cold freezer until we're ready to use them. And then we take them out, dry them out, and we put them on film. Now, we do this part in the dark room, which I didn't show y'all because you wouldn't be able to see anything in there. Then we leave them in there for one week, and then we take them out. And look, now we have pictures of them on these radiographs. Now we take the radiographs, and we take them over here to this viewer. And here is a camera that's attached to the computer where we can take pictures and send them directly over. Then once we're at the computer, we bring up the brain images and we can analyze everything we need to know. So after taking lots and lots of brains at lots of different time points, we can look at different biological clock genes, metabolic rhythms, and finally, we will know what's going on in the sparrow's brain. So all the research on biological clocks is really recent and there's a lot of stuff we don't know. But 10 or 20 years down the road, we hope to know enough that maybe we can have a treatment or a therapy or a medication to help people that have biological clock dysfunctions. What I find fascinating about biological clock research and why it's so rewarding is because there's a lot not known about it that is still out there for us to discover. So every time you're doing research in the lab and you find something new, that's something that no one else ever knew before. And I just think that's really cool. And also, I want to be a doctor. so knowing that someday the research that we're doing can help someone someday is just another reason for me to want to do it. Well, that's the end of our tour here. That's all I have to show you. I hope you learned something, and maybe I'll see you around on campus someday. But right now, you got to get out of here, because I have some work to do.